Hello and welcome to the Korean Beauty Show podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, the founder of Style Story, your online go-to where you can shop, learn and explore the world of Korean skincare and of course your guide to the world of Korean beauty. So for today's episode, I wanted to do something a little bit different that I haven't really done before. So if you have been following me or Style Story or Jellico, you might have seen that Jellico's Bubble Tea Steam Cream, which was our very first product, has recently turned two. So it's two years since we released our first product. And what I wanted to do for something just a little bit different is run through some of the lessons that I've learned from two years with Jellico, uh, because it has been a pretty crazy ride. Obviously, everything took place in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we've had a couple of babies born on our team as well. And, you know, we've had a lot going on in our personal lives in the meantime, at the same time as we've been trying to, you know, grow this brand from scratch. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, there have been some things that we've done that I wouldn't do again. Uh, and we've learned a whole lot of different stuff. So I thought I might run through some of them. Now, the first one is that I have learned to go with my gut. Uh, And what I mean by that is oftentimes, particularly when you're running a business, but also just generally in life, you can tend to doubt yourself and go, is this a good idea? Is this going to be a massive flop? Like, can I actually do this? And I had all of those kind of things running through my head before we launched. It's a whole lot of pressure to uh, launch a new brand, particularly when I've been working in the in the in this space for quite a while. You know, if you put a product out there and everyone hates it, I was super worried that then people would be like, oh, you know, whatever that they would think certain things of me, you know, or maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about after all, because this product is no good, or you know, that maybe it would even not be good for a star story, which is obviously, you know, my baby as well. That is my business, my first business that I started. So I had a whole lot of reasons why I could have just gone, yeah, no, this is not a good idea. But all signs were pointing to it being the right time. So we had been in discussions with a couple of people over in the US to actually launch something offline. And what we realized once we sort of got part way through our discussions with them after a few months, we realized that we didn't actually have the products that they were really looking for, uh, you know, something that would actually work and translate over in the States. And so we ended ended up basically going back to the drawing board and going, what uh, w- if we want to make you the most of an opportunity like this, what do we actually need to do? Uh, and the only way we could really get around this was to manufacture something new for ourselves that we could then, you know, run with and give to them. So that's actually part of the reason that we decided to start the brand in the first place is because we really wanted to make the most of this opportunity. The other thing was was, of course, that over the years, both as a K-beauty fan and as someone that runs a K-beauty business, I had just been heartbroken again and again and again by products that were our favorites, that were our customers' favorites, either going out of production uh, or the formula changed and then the new product was not the same as the previous one and people were like, this used to be my favorite and it's not my favorite anymore because X, Y, or Z. Uh, And then, you know, obviously as a distributor as well, you know, sometimes your relationship with the brand changes, particularly if the brand gets really famous in the meantime, you know, brands that you used to work really well with, maybe they don't, you know, they're not as responsive, uh, they're not as nice to work with as they once used to be. And so we just had a few experiences like that, that we were like, we are not in control of any of this. You know, if our favorite product goes out of production tomorrow, there's nothing that we can do about it. So we really wanted to create first a product that we loved uh, and that was the most important thing so everyone in our team was like super on board for creating a product that we all were in love with Uh, and we're different people we have different skin types different needs and things like that Uh, and you know obviously so does all of the people 
in our immediate families and whatnot. But we wanted to create a product that we would be proud of, that we would love. Uh, And also the other thing was that, you know, um, having products that are constantly changing and new, I get that that's super exciting and I know that that's the thing in Korea. But having grown up in Australia and, you know, just seeing that I also liked to try new products, like the same as everyone else. When something new comes out, it's really exciting. But even from the time I was a teenager, I had some staple products in my skincare routine, in my makeup routine, uh, that no matter what else I would try, I knew that I had that really solid, reliable product that I could go and get. So if I went out and bought something that I didn't absolutely love, at least I had my favorite. And I kind of wanted to create a product that would be like that as well. Uh, You know, so that was what my gut was telling me. My gut was telling me, I get that people love newness and freshness and, you know, you, you'll see on Instagram, there's some people that seem to use different products every single day and I get it and that's great. But for a lot of people, I think knowing that you have just this really trustworthy product in your arsenal gives you the... Um, maybe even the courage to go out and try some different stuff because you're not as worried. If it doesn't work out and you don't like it, you've still got your favorite, you know, your golden oldie. Uh, I've had so many products like that over the years, like mascaras, uh, the old Sally Hansen that I absolutely loved that product um, to, you know, um, get the Sally Hansen spray that used to spray all over your legs. You know, that was just, I always had a bottle of that growing up in Australia. Uh, and I wanted to create a product that would just be that product for people. People. Uh, when it came to like the inspiration for the product itself, this was the other thing that I was, I really just went with my gut on because you can try and create a really like scientific brand and pretend you're a doctor, you know, and, you know, call it doctor something or other. And, you know, people will pay a lot more money for that kind of thing because anything that's shrouded in the veneer of, you know, science and chemistry and, you know, that sort of thing, people just automatically seem to trust it a bit more. Uh, And, you know, whether that's right or wrong, you know, I've seen plenty of people giving advice on the internet that's just wrong, even though they are chemists and doctors and all of these things, you know, they don't know everything about everything, but people are much more inclined to believe them because anything scientific sort of sells. And it's hard for the the regular person, the everyday person to, uh, you know, fight back or it's hard for them to, you know, give evidence to the contrary. So oftentimes with those kind of brands, they'll charge a whole lot more money uh, for doing that as well. And then you've got like your luxury skincare brands. There's all these different kinds of things. But what I thought to myself was, you know what, I already know all of the ins and outs in terms of like what I want the formula to feel like, look like, the kind of ingredients that I would put in there, the kind of ingredients that are going to make a difference to the skin. So I don't really think that I need to lean so hard into the science of skincare angle just because I know a lot about, you know, for what goes into making a product and, you know, the kind of ingredients and things like that. You could lean into all of that, but I was just like, I think what I want in a product is something that I really look forward to using every single day. And I was thinking, you know, what do I actually look forward to in my daily life? And one of the big ones for me is something a little bit sweet, a little bit of a treat, dessert, things like that. Like I am a big sweet tooth. I love my food, but my most of all, I love just little treats. I think that life is like a series of little treats that you get to look forward to. So like dessert at the end of the day, maybe your coffee in the morning, things like that. So I was like, why don't we make our products around that kind of thing? Like something that you are going to look forward to using. And with skincare, I think it kind of goes without saying that it should work. It should do what it says on the tin. Uh, It's all the other stuff that sort of, you know, makes you want to use it or not. Like if it's a bad product, it's a bad product. Doesn't matter how good or how scientific the marketing is, people are not going to buy it again because it's no good. So that the starting point is a good product. But then something that like 
you know, would make me want to use it. Like I use skincare too. So that was, that was a really important thing, I think, was to just go with my gut. Uh, we actually did up a whole list of like all of the different desserts and treats and stuff like that that we liked. And we still actually have that list and we consult it when we're like going to make new products. Um, yeah, so that's how the the name Jellico kind of came about as a result of that because we were like, well, we also really like jelly-ish textures. Um, maybe we could do something with that. You know, we didn't want to call it like, you know, sweet skincare or anything like that. But we were just kind of, you know, trying to play off different things. Um, unfortunately, we did run into a little bit of trouble with the trademark. So we were searching, I think we were originally going to even trademark Jelly Co with a C-O. Uh, and then when we looked it up, we tried to register something and they were like, no, C-O, even though it's in a different um you know, class, no, that's already been taken. So that's when we made the call to change it to KO. Uh, so it became Jelly Co, KO. And we were like, look, uh, we can just, the KO is for Korea, obviously, like whether we can make that work. So that's fine. Uh, so, you know, not overthinking it too much and just sort of going with my gut. That was the first big lesson I learned. Uh, so, and I, I definitely don't regret that. I mean, look, the marketing that we do for, for our brand is a bit fun. It's a bit playful. It's not super serious, but the results are like fun, but functional products. That's kind of what we make. That's what we do. Uh, and yeah, it goes without saying that all the formulas are really good. Like we've put a lot of work into them. We've, you know, been really, really particular about the ingredients, the formulations, the texture, all of that sort of thing. So I feel comfortable with that to have a bit more of a fun marketing approach to it. That's kind of where we landed. Uh, and I guess the other really big lesson that I've learned over the years in general, but particularly with Jellico, was to work with people that we like, people that you like. Uh, and that's because, you know, over the years uh, as a manufacturer and also consulting, I have come across and had the misfortune of working with some people, not many, who just uh, weren't very nice. You know, I have had some pushback over the years for being a female founder and a young founder and have found that some manufacturers and some people in the industry here in Korea don't take that very seriously. Um, I've had one of our members of staff be mistreated by a manufacturer that we were working with in the past and verbally abused. And I sort of stood up for her uh, and, you know, that relationship soured really, really quickly. Uh, and, you know, it just got to the point that every time we had to contact this person, and work with them we were just like anxious and didn't really want to have the conversation and it really made the whole thing super super stressful so when it came to this time for our own products knowing that we wanted to have a good ongoing relationship with the manufacturer we decided to work with someone that was just easy to work with, someone that we really liked their work, but we also really liked them. And we did the same thing for our boxes. So with the company that manufactures our boxes, we've used different companies over the years. And, you know, it's not to say that the output is that different. It's pretty similar. But the experience that we had when we, whenever we made boxes with this particular company was just above and beyond. Uh, the director of the company used to drive three of us like out in his car, like around to the various different plants where they were doing, you know, the embossing, the physical boxes, doing the cutting, introduce us to, to them, let us see the process, let us pick things out. Whereas other people we work with were like, no, you can't come and inspect anything. Basically, you just pay us the money, turn it over to us, and then, you know, that's it. You'll see the finished product. And, you know, as a new company and a new brand, and, you know, we'd never done this before, there were a lot of elements that kind of needed to come together. And we wanted to be sure that we were happy with it. We don't have, you know, 
uh, like millions of dollars set aside to like give it a go and if it works it works so every dollar was really important to us we wanted to make sure that we you know got a product that we were confident in and happy to actually put out there so going and inspecting and doing all of this stuff was really important to us and not everyone understood that but some people did so they were the people that we ended up working with because we were just like we just want this process to be as seamless as possible and we know if we can go out there and see the colors in real life and see it all being made that we will feel confident in it so we did that and we found companies luckily that are happy to do that with us and that has been a really big game changer uh, and made things just a lot easier so that's one thing that i have learned as well over the course of the last two years The third thing I have learned is to celebrate the wins when they do happen because they don't happen all of the time. And I think that's also just a great life lesson. You know, sometimes something really, really awesome happens to you. And I think it's really important to take a moment and just go, wow, this is amazing because it's not an everyday thing, you know. Uh, And so the first time that that happened to us was when we very first launched Bubble Tea Steam Cream. And we saw the level of interest and we were just like, oh my gosh, like this is actually exciting that people are excited for the product. We got featured in a whole bunch of media straight away off the back of the release. Uh, News.com.au, Body and Soul, uh, Cosmetics Design Asia were just a couple of them that I can think of. Uh, And the product actually sold out three times not long after it launched. So that was just we, that was a pinch me moment for us. We were really, really excited because we just didn't know. Like before we launched it, we just weren't sure what the reaction would be, what people would think of it, uh, whether anyone would buy it. Like it's always a gamble. I have launched enough products on Style Story to know that even being a good product is sometimes just not enough to save it. We've had brands over the years that I thought were just beautiful, you know, really cleverly done, very well thought out, and they just didn't translate. For whatever reason, people just didn't buy them. Um and the brands never really took off. And it's always really disappointing because you do everything you can, but sometimes if it doesn't fly, it just really flops. Uh, And so, you know, it could easily have been that kind of a situation. So we we were really lucky, but also that was something that I learned is just to celebrate those little moments because there's a lot of really tough moments in business where you're just pulling your hair out. uh, And that brings me to my next point is that not everyone will like everything that you do, but that is okay. So when it came to bubble tea steam cream, the product was a hit with our customers basically from the very first day. I think we had orders coming in pretty much from the moment we launched it. But that's not to say, you know, it it, it became the most reviewed product on our site. I think at the moment it's sitting on like a 4.9 out of 5 star rating. Uh, So all good things. But that is not to say that absolutely everybody liked it. And we did have some bloggers in particular, people that we sent the product out to in the beginning, you know, when we first launched and we were like, here, you know, try this product. Uh, And, you know, these were people who hadn't paid for the product uh, and they sort of said, no, didn't like it, (laughs) you know, uh, you know, nothing special or something like that. And when you have put so much time and so much of yourself into the process of making something, comments like that really sting. Uh, And on social media, you know, I think people can tend to forget that there are people behind that. Like, my team sees that too. Team members that have, you know, missed things because they were working on this, team members that have put their heart and soul into it, they have to read those comments online. And, you know, oftentimes people will tag you in it when they're, you know, bashing you, which is, I get it, like that's the way that social media goes. But I think people tend to forget that, like, the people that made this product are seeing it. Like, I get that you don't need to like anything, but some of the comments were just very harsh. Like, I remember some Someone was like, no, I gave it away to someone as a hand cream. And I was like, okay, well, it's definitely not going to make a very good hand cream, but like just unnecessary. But what I realized is that first up, people tend to value things less when they haven't paid for them. So people that get stuff for free are far more likely to criticize and go, meh, whatever, than the people that actually bought the product. That just seems to be a thing. And the other thing is that the people that tried it 
most of the people who tried it not only loved it, but they actually came back for more. They came back for a second jar. And that product now, two years later, has one of the highest repurchase rates on our site. It hovers between about a 70 to 80 percent. So, you know, not everyone will like it, but it's okay. Not everyone needs to. And I think that was A really important thing uh, for me to just accept is that, you know what, the people that it's made for and that it's perfect for, they will find the product and that's who you really need to worry about. Not the people that, you know, tried it one time and, you know, whatever, didn't pay for it and had a whole lot of complaints about it. Like they're not the people to focus on for us, for our own mental health as well. You know, if we spend all our time worrying about that, we're not going to be doing what we need to be doing. Uh, But that was a big lesson to learn is that, you know, you don't have to be for everybody and that's okay. Do what you can, the best job you can and make the best products you can for the people that are perfect for the brand and the product. And so that is what we have focused our attention on and tried to just, you know, take our licks when we get them and then move on, be in the right frame of mind to actually serve and service the people that the product is made for, that the product is perfect for uh, and focus on them and their feedback and making sure they're happy rather than the people that aren't happy. So that was a really big one. And then last but not least, we have realized and I have learned that distribution is really, really important for a small brand. So last year, we ended up launching on VeryShop in the US. VeryShop is like an online platform and people can buy our Jellico products there. Uh, And then, of course, this year in March, we launched on Woolworths.com.au. So Woolworths is the largest supermarket in Australia uh, and we are available on their online store so people can, you know, shop and pick up their groceries uh, and, you know, add their Jelly Co products into that as well. So that has been a real game changer for us, for our brand that has made a, a world of difference. And that has led to the latest milestone that we have achieved. And that is that we are about to launch offline for the first time in the US. Uh, and this has been something that we have been working on. Like I mentioned, we were in discussions with Uh, people in the US years ago and that didn't end up going ahead but since then we've kind of been working in the background to see what we can do we've been talking with lots of different stores and places and we have finally secured confirmation actually just in the last couple of weeks that we have a spot in an offline store so that I will release all the full details as soon as we are live and in store but basically where we're at with that is we've received the first order from them We are now training their team to let them know everything that they need to know about our products. Uh, So that is a massive, massive step for us, something that we are so excited about uh, and hopeful that this will be the, the first of many offline opportunities for our brand. So it has been a crazy, crazy two years. You know, we've had ups and downs. We've had a lot of hectic stuff to worry about with, you know, shipping and all of these kind of things, Um, you know, to Australia, to the US. We've had, you know, customers buying our Jellico products from all over the world uh, from Style Story and then shipping them over there. And, you know, we've had delays and people that have waited longer than we wanted them to wait for their products. And we've met so many fabulous people, so many people that have supported our brand and reached out to tell us that they love the products, uh, you know, all of that sort of thing. So that is what I'm super thankful for on Bubble Tea Steam Cream's second birthday. I can say after two years that it was all worth it, all of the stress, all of the dramas that we have had. Uh, I'm really, really proud of the product. I'm so thankful and happy that people like it. I know not everyone likes it and that's fine if that's you, Uh, but I am very, very happy that we have a very fierce but loyal customer base that absolutely loves the product. That means the world to me. Uh, So yeah, I just wanted to share a couple of those lessons. Some of them are very life, much life lessons, not necessarily business. Uh, So, you know, if there is something that you have been just mulling over, stewing on, thinking about for ages, 
wanting to do but you just let all of those doubts creep in and give yourself all the reasons why you couldn't or shouldn't do it just take a chance because you just don't know you have to make a start the first step is always the hardest Uh, and no matter what happens I can confidently say that you will learn things and make mistakes that then once you've made them it's over and you don't have to make them again but starting is really the hardest thing to do so I hope that that was interesting to hear about some of the things that have gone on for us over the last couple of years. I'm going to leave it here for today, but I will be back in your ears next week. And in the meantime, I will see you on Style Story. Bye.